All right. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Kevin, and I'd like to welcome you to our latest NoBedge webinar series episode. Uh, today, we are partnering up with none other than our friend, Chris Stringer from um, uh, Objects Online. Uh, and in today's presentation, Chris is going to demonstrate the robustness of Advent's Arlantis 5 uh, as a powerful, easy-to-use 3D rendering application developed for architects and designers that's ideal for the quick and easy creation of high-resolution 3D renderings, animations, QuickTime VR objects, iVisit 3D panoramas. Um, this webinar is an exclusive first look at many of the new features in Arlantis 5, uh, which went live, I think, Chris, yesterday, right? That's correct. Awesome. Cool. So we're very lucky to work with Chris again and to talk about Arlantis 5. And for those of you who aren't aware who, of who Chris is, um, Chris Stringer was the general manager um, excuse me, of Objects Online, Advent's Arlantis distributor in the U.S. and Canada, and a BIMobject.com U.S. franchise. Uh, he was trained as an architect, and Chris has been involved in architectural software sales, training, and support since 1996. Uh, his professional interests include 3D parametric modeling and 3D visualization. And I think, Chris, um, there's some changes that have happened um, recently as well. Um, would you like to talk about that? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, so um, uh, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, you're, you're probably uh, aware, and you own Artlantis, you're probably aware of who Objects in Line is already. Um, but uh, the, I guess the, the bittersweet news with... Uh, the release of uh, Art Lantis uh, 5 uh, in the uh, start of the uh, Art Lantis online store is uh, uh, the good news is you can purchase Art Lantis through that online store. The bad news for us, I guess you could say, is uh, uh, there's no real need for objects online anymore. So we are going away, uh, and, uh, and uh, the purchase of Art Lantis uh, will, will still continue to happen through our reseller network, of course, Novage being uh, one of our... Uh, important resellers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but uh, uh, the distribution of Artlantis will be handled through the uh, Artlantis uh, online store. Uh, and that ties in with another new thing uh, <coughs> uh, or new feature of Artlantis, which is the uh, Artlantis Media Store, which is built into the software. Uh, we'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But anyway, so objects online, yes, we are going away. <clears throat> and uh, it's been about 15 years. It's been a good good run. We appreciate all the support we've gotten from our loyal customers over the years. And, uh, you know, it, it has been a good time. I've met a lot of people and I've made a lot of friends. And uh, But now it's time to move on. I'm going to continue to be working with Advent, though, uh, in a support capacity. I'll be a support specialist, be working behind the scenes um, and uh, fielding uh, questions in the primarily in the North American market, um, as well as working on uh, demo materials, training materials, uh, adding media to the uh, Artlinus Media Store, things of that nature. So I'm going to be still working uh, behind the scenes uh, with Artlinus. Um, so that's, uh, that's the big news for uh, Objects Online, in addition cool. to the big news, bigger news about Artlinus 5, which is what we're really <laughs> excited about. So Yeah. Well, uh, so... About that, we're going to learn more about Arlantis 5 with today's presentation, which is about 40 minutes long, uh, but we'll also save time for a Q&A, and if we do go over it a little bit, um, if it gives us an opportunity to explore a little bit further with Chris, uh, that's going to be cool too. So if you have any questions, submit them at any time into the chat window below. Uh, but before we get going with the presentation, here's an overview of what we do at Novage. Uh, as Chris briefly mentioned, um, you know, well, the Novage webinar series is brought to you by Novage.com. Uh, we are one of the largest online design software uh, resellers um, online, and we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every, every designer's need. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing, uh, picking up a copy of Atlantis 5, it is available from us in the United States and Canada as a digital delivery. Uh, so if you want more information, uh, you're welcome to call and speak with our sales specialist, uh, Bob Thayer, uh, of whom you can reach at uh, bob at Novage.com. And I do want to mention, mention that um, if you're not getting enough information from us, I hope we are. Uh, there's other questions. Uh, if you have any, any other stuff about Artlantis 5 that you want to learn more about, you can contact Chris. And you can also head on over to the Artlantis website as well. Uh, oh, that's very cool. And if you want to get a glimpse at who is changing the world of design one step at a time, uh, please visit our Novage's very own blog. Um, every week our interviews shine a light on those innovators whose work break out from the norm. 
And I do want to mention that answers from your webinar questions will be shared here as well. So for more details, please visit us at blog.novich.com. And I'd like to invite you to visit vectorworking.com. Um, Novich is an online community for Vectorworks users, designers, and professionals. Uh, so join us as we discuss the latest Vectorworks buzz, catch up on um, a, with a, catch up on the latest news with a subscription to our weekly newsletter. Uh, so if you want to learn more, head on over to vectorworking.com today. Uh, coming up next week, um, the AutoCAD Revit LT Suite 2014 with both AutoCAD LT 2014 and Revit LT 2014 offers an affordable transition to the world of building information modeling, also known as BIM, um, without sacrificing the AutoCAD LT software you know and love. Uh, this session will introduce you to the similarities and differences between AutoCAD LT and Revit from AutoCAD users' perspective. Uh, so this webinar is free and will last about an hour, and you are welcome to join us. Uh, so if you want to sign up for this free event, uh, head on over to novich.com slash webinar slash 86. And last but not least, if you have to leave early, no worries. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, and if you want to rewatch uh, episode 85 in its entirety, as, you can, as always, you can find it on our Novich webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. With that said, um, Chris, are you ready? I am. You caught me with my mouth full, though. I had a <laughs> some water. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, I'm ready. Cool. All right. I will switch over to you right about now. Okay. There you go. Take it away. Uh, okay. All right, attendees, if you guys have questions, um, let me know. I'll be in the background. Enjoy. All right. Yeah, and Kevin, just uh, alert me if there are any relevant questions because I'm cool. not I'm probably going to be looking at them. So. Cool. Absolutely. <laughs> at least not until the end. All right. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. I appreciate everyone uh, taking time out of their busy day or or a peaceful evening, wherever you may be located, uh, to attend this webinar. And uh, <clears throat> as uh, Kevin so eloquently put it, uh, we're here to talk about Artlantis 5. And uh, we're going to delve into some of the new features uh, of Artlantis 5. This won't be an, an exhaustive uh, webinar, but uh, we will cover some of the highlights and uh, give you a feel for what's uh, included in Atlantis 5. I'm still learning the software myself because uh, it is uh, you know, still brand spanking new. So um, uh, I do uh, have Atlantis open uh, right now, and I have a, uh, a project uh, on the screen. So what you're seeing here is the Atlantis 5 interface. Um, tell you what, I'm going to uh, close this project out just to give you uh, an idea of what you would see when you first launch Artlantis. Uh, so this is what you would see this screen here. Your most recent projects that you uh, had, have had open are uh, going to display in uh, this sort of large thumbnail view, which is very handy, very uh, simple and easy way to navigate your most recent projects. Down at the bottom right, uh, we have <coughs> um, images from the Artlantis user gallery. So this is a quick way to uh, kind of check out what uh, some of your uh, uh, friends and allies in the Artlantis world are, are doing. Um, and uh, so you can see thumbnails of some of the images, uh, most recent images that have been posted to the Artlantis uh, user gallery. And up at the left here, this little RSS feed logo, um, uh, when there's any news about Artlantis, such as uh, uh, an update that's available or something uh, you know, of that nature, you'll see a little number, uh, red number, appear on this symbol. And you'll be able to click on it and uh, read a, a little news blurb. And, and uh, oftentimes there will be links to uh, uh, various places where you can find out more information about whatever that news item is. So um, I'm going to go ahead now and jump straight into the uh, project I have here, so it's loading up. And uh, you know, I guess I should also take a step back and address uh, folks who may be attending this webinar and uh, who are fairly new to Artlantis, uh, maybe haven't been using Artlantis before. Um, Artlantis is a dedicated rendering application. It doesn't do modeling. Uh, it does work with 3D models, so you have to have modeled them in some other package or you perhaps maybe purchase some Artlantis uh, media objects, things of that nature. Um, but uh, Artlantis' sole reason for being is uh, to create renderings quickly and easily, high quality renderings, um, and to do so very efficiently through the use of a real-time preview window. So that's the idea, is to make the rendering processes as quick and easy as possible and to give you the best results 
uh, in the shortest amount of time. It's not the, let's say, the best rendering package in the world with all the bells and whistles, um, but I think you're going to find that it's going to do a very high percentage of what you're going to need to do on a day-to-day -day basis in, our, in an architectural office to create architectural renderings. That's, uh, that's really what it's intended to do. Um, and where Artlinus uh, provides an advantage over, let's say, using a built-in rendering engine in your modeling software is, it, in fact, due to the fact that it's a separate application. So while you're uh, you know, modeling in, let's say, Revit or ArchiCAD or Vectorworks uh, or SketchUp, um, you know, you've got all this additional overhead dedicated to modeling and dedicated to redrawing the screen and different views and things of that nature that just simply aren't relevant to the rendering process. So when you get into Atlantis, it's a breath of fresh air because it is strictly doing what it needs to do to create uh, the rendered image and nothing more. Uh, so that means it can dedicate its uh, preview uh, window to real-time uh, uh, sort of view of your project. I can navigate in real time and I get a very quick refresh in uh, radiosity. So radiosity is a high quality rendering mode uh, that Artlana supports uh, that is very, um, in the preview window, is very true to what the finished output is going to look like in Artlana. So you're getting this information, this feedback real time. And that's just really not often possible in most uh, BIM software applications. Um, so that's the, the true advantage of that kind of that mode of working uh, in Atlantis using a dedicated rendering package. Um, all right, Kevin, before I continue on, you can hear me okay, right? We're doing all right with that? Sound Absolutely. With everything and no lag on the screen? No lag on the screen. Well, just a little Great. bit. Okay. All right. A little bit? Okay. Um, well, I'm seeing lag on my screen too. As I drag, uh, the, uh, what it, is, it is normal to see the uh, image get kind of blocky and then it will resolve itself over a period of a few seconds. So that, that will be normal. You, you're probably seeing some of that uh, on your end as well. So let's talk about this new interface in Artlantis 5. So the idea behind this uh, Artlantis 5 release um, and how you know, we differentiate it from, let's say, Artlantis 4. Artlantis 4, a lot of uh, what was included in Artlantis 4 had to do with speed and efficiency. Uh, Artlantis 5 is really all about um, new interface and clean, bold, simple design, uh, which supports a, wor a better working method uh, when you're using Artlantis. So you can see a lot of the palettes have been stripped away in Artlantis. Uh, they're not gone completely, but they're neatly tucked away on the edges of the screen. And so I can click these little hand tools here to pop those windows uh, up to see whatever you know, contextual menu I happen to be in at the time uh, that will appear for me on the screen. So uh, you still have access to um, the different inspectors in Atlantis in this menu here. And one of the important things uh, uh, that uh, you know, Avin ought to be congratulated on is really making the interface essentially uh, the same between Mac and Windows. It's, it's virtually identical now. So you still have uh, you know, a menu up here on the top for uh, a few items, uh, this file menu and edit and so on and so forth and the inspectors, but then you have this dedicated menu which drop down, drops down a contextual menu depending on what area of the program you're working in and these parameters are going to change uh, depending on what item you select to edit and work on in Atlantis. So, uh, so anyway, back to the, ra the uh, real-time radiosity preview window. So uh, this is handling, uh, obviously, shadow and lighting and things of that nature and texture, which is what Artlinus deals with. Um, one of the things you can do if uh, you're noticing uh, kind of a lag in the screen redraw, you have this option uh, up here in this window now to change the frames per second on the screen redraw. So you can drop it down uh, or uh, you can access the slider and uh, bump it up or down this way. So if you have a really fast machine, you might uh, want to max it out. Um, if you've got a you know, multi-core processor, uh, for me, I'm running on a laptop, so I'm gonna, and it's a couple years old, so I'm going to uh, keep mine at a relatively low setting. Um, so, uh, but yes, again, uh, the navigation here is real time. Um, as we uh, delve into Artlantis, there's uh, some things you need to know. Uh, 
in terms of setting up cameras and that sort of thing, as I switch to the perspective um, inspector, uh, the menu on the side is going to change. Now, if I uh, if I uh, uh, tab this out and keep it locked in that position, uh, you'll also notice, of course, the uh, the sidebar changes uh, depending on uh, where we happen to be in the menu. So, for example, the list of shaders will show up. If I jump over to perspectives, the list of uh, uh, perspectives that have been saved, the perspective views, will appear in this window. Um, so I'm going to jump into the next scene, which is the physical camera scene. Now we have this handy pull down, which is a quick way to navigate through the different saved views that we have in our Atlantis. So I'm going to switch to the physical cam um, camera that we have here and point out a couple of things. Uh, we have right now um, uh, a setting uh, for the camera. Let's see here. Uh, we can pull up. Uh, where it's set to physical camera. So that's, that's uh, behaving like a real camera would with an ISO and shutter speed setting. So as we uh, bump these kinds of familiar control, controls up or down, you can notice the, the visible effects <coughs> of adjusting the ISO or adjusting the shutter speed uh, to uh, uh, you know, how that kind of affects the lighting levels or the, let's say the level of exposure in the, in the image. Um, so we can do those things manually on the fly, or we can choose from a couple of different presets that are kind of appropriate depending on whether you're inside the building or outside. So we could choose the interior um, setting there, and that's going to pull up something that should be fairly relevant to uh, an interior type of view. Hey, um, Chris, I do want to interrupt. Uh, Chad had his question, um, how come I do not sure. see this fiscal cam pull-down menu? It's accessible. I'm going to cancel out of this setting. Uh, I, hopefully you can see this on the right-hand side. There's the settings, edit rendering parameters. That pops up. If I click that gear button, then you'll see the uh, settings for the perspective camera uh, that you happen to have. So your size, rendering size settings, your DPI, uh, level of anti-aliasing. So those are things that uh, it normally, uh, previously in Artlands, you'd have to actually invoke the rendering uh, menu uh, to access that, the, that level of control. Uh, so now it's accessible through the, uh, just simply clicking on that button. So if I choose the interior lighting and then click OK, then that setting's going to stick for that camera now. So each uh, camera that you set up in Artlandis has a variety of independently uh, set parameters. So uh, I can go in and set up an exterior camera with exterior lighting settings or exterior camera settings and have that stick and save just with that camera view. And then I can go set up a, another camera in the interior. And then I can go set up a night view um, and have a different kind of uh, time of day set for the sun. So you have all these different, uh, a number of different parameters that are unique in, to each uh, scene that you set up in our Atlantis. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, the next view, which is the architect's camera. <clears throat> and this uh, view points out one of the uh, new features in Atlantis, which is a little time saver. You can, uh, well, it's a shortcut to the desktop, as they, <laughs> as they say. I'm going to have to relaunch Atlantis to get back to that view. Um, but uh, uh, they have added uh, in Atlantis 5 the ability to um, uh, set up a uh, two-point perspective so where you have this uh, uh, distortion uh, correction. So all your verticals now are going to be uh, uh, lined up with the uh, vertical edges of the, uh, of the page or of the frame. Um, so if I jump back into that architect cam view again, this little button right here is how that is invoked. So you'll see the way that the camera is, it's sort of angled up right now. So that gives, uh, that creates a little bit of perspective uh, to the building. If you're, if you're an architect, you're familiar with uh, that. And so if we click uh, this button here, then that sets up that perspective correction um, so that your, uh, your uh, vertical edges remain orthogonal or, or aligned to the uh, sides of the, uh, of the window. And I'm going to jump into the next scene, and we're going to talk about the 3D sky in Atlantis. <clears throat> so this view uh, shows how the sky is set up in Atlantis. So right now, if we uh, go into this uh, uh, setting here, you've got 
uh, if you're familiar with our Atlantis, the, the familiar settings for the different settings for the sky. There's the Heliodon sky, which basically is a uh, modeled sky environment in our Atlantis. It's, a, it's an environment simulator in our Atlantis. We have the gradients, uh, which give you the option of up to four different um, color choices um, for your sky. So you could, um, depending on what you want to do, uh, set up uh, a custom setting for the sky uh, that might mimic a sunset if you wanted to, to give more of a painterly effect to your uh, gradient sky. Um, and then there is uh, the uh, image-based background, which can use several different kinds of images uh, for the background. Um, flat images, uh, 3D image backgrounds, and HDRI uh, image backgrounds. But let's, let's go into the Heliodon sky uh, for a minute and talk about uh, some of the uh, options that are available there. So um, if we go into the Heliodon setting, then we will have access to the clouds. Uh, so that the you know, all these controls or parameters are laid out in this horizontal scheme here. So we'll click on clouds, and uh, if you have seen the clouds in our Atlantis before, you'll uh, recognize the way these look. We can click on the clouds button and pull up or invoke the uh, additional parameters for those clouds so we can dial up or down the different types of clouds, and we'll see that reflected in uh, our 3D view. So we can knock the cirrus clouds down. Uh, and just play with those different settings until we find uh, something that we like. And of course, we can also um, click on the dice button to pull up different seeds. These are randomized uh, configurations for the clouds in the sky. Uh, they still reflect the uh, slider settings you have here, but they just kind of pull up different uh, randomized uh, uh, parameters. Uh, you can have the clouds match the sun if you want uh, that effect happening. Click OK here. And um, let's see, I'm going to drop this serious class down a little bit. So um, now, of course, this environment is uh, fully three-dimensional. So if we go back into our camera settings and we spin around the view a little bit, you can see how the sky or the clouds in the sky are moving with the background. Oops, I dropped down a little bit too much. So reorient myself. But yeah, it's a fully immersive 3D uh, wraparound environment for, uh, for your scene in Atlantis. Um, and I'll also, I'll, I'll show uh, in this view, um, uh, in the Heliodon settings, uh, right now we have the sun tied to a, uh, a real world location. And, uh, you know, it happens to be San Diego. Uh, we could switch it to San Francisco to capture what the, the lighting might look like around uh, the time of this demo. Um, and uh, we can pull up the date and uh, set that to whatever we want. And uh, we can also set up a custom sun setting where we have independent control of the sun and can basically orient that sun wherever we want. So we can drop the elevation down using this handy slider. You can see how this, the sun uh, gets repositioned in the sky. And then um, we can also reorient the uh, position around the dome as to where that sun uh, happens to be located. We can also just, if, once the sun is visible in the sky, we can actually click and, and drag it into whatever position we want. Um, so the lower we drag the sun in the sky, the more the sky starts to emulate um, an evening sky. You can start to see color. The evening colors get introduced into the sky automatically. And those, uh, those settings can be uh, tweaked, if you want, um, by you know, mixing in a, a different sky color or that sort of thing if you want to. achieve a certain effect that way. Um, let's jump into the HDRI background now and talk about that. So HDRI was introduced, I guess I better get back to my sun setting here and switch to the... 
Chris, um, since we're on the topic of the sun, uh, James wants to know. James, yes, sir. Uh, oh, sure. sorry. Uh, James wants to know: Can the sun be animated? Uh, yeah, absolutely, it can be animated. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that near the end of the presentation. Uh, you just simply uh, in your sequence, any sequence is going to have a start, starting point, and a stopping point. So you just simply configure a different. Uh, time setting or a different date setting for the sun at the end of the sequence uh, than what you had at the beginning of the sequence, and then Artlanus will automatically interpolate uh, the changes in time through that sequence. So if you have a 10 second sequence, it will you know, interpolate the position of the sun through the sky during that, those uh, 10 seconds. Um, anyway, back to the HDRI uh, settings here. So we jump back into our perspective settings. And we can um, switch to our image based background. Uh, we can go down to our navigator here and choose our image library. So you can see all these little icons in the navigator. This is the catalog of <coughs> uh, media in our planet. It's probably a good time to talk about this now since we're going to use it. Um, we've got our shaders. Uh, the, these icons represent sort of broad categories. So these are general materials. These are wall surfaces. These are floor surfaces. These are exterior shaders. These are natural shaders, uh, things like grass, ground, things of that nature. Um, and if we click on each of those buttons, we'll see uh, how we flip through the different uh, options that are available in that catalog. Um, so, and we can also shrink this uh, uh, series of thumbnails up or down a little bit if we want to to uh, see more of the preview window or more of the thumbnail. Um, anyway, so as we navigate through these things, you'll see, uh, you know, we can scroll left or right and access all the different uh, shaders that are that are in here. And also. Um, uh, we also have access to objects, so the, the second set of icons uh, represent uh, different types of uh, 3D objects, furniture, decorations, lamps, office-related uh, objects, transportation, plants, and so forth. So as you navigate or hover over those items, you should see a, a window pop up to identify what that is. And then if you click on it, it will just filter uh, the results you're seeing in, the, in this preview window to that specific category. Um, billboards here and uh, back to the images. So these are the images um, that we have <coughs> in our image library. Now I'm going to talk about another thing we can do. We can also uh, click on this thumbnail to see a larger version of the um, catalog. So you'll see that the uh, window collapses automatically um, to uh, get out of the way since it knows that you're going to be uh, looking through the catalog here instead of um, down at the bottom. So I can click on the uh, HDRI uh, or I can navigate um, in my uh, hard drive and locate an HDRI image. I don't in fact have any loaded so I'm just going to uh, double click this and browse. I don't know if you caught that. I double click the uh, background. This is the background button. This is the foreground button. We'll talk about the foreground in a second. The background, I double click that and I click browse to navigate uh, my hard drive. I guess I'll also activate the HDRI and, and browse. And I'm going to find in my project folder, I have a few uh, HDRI images uh, selected that I think work nicely. And we'll select this first one here and open it. And that will force that uh, background now to be used in the art mask window. I'll click OK and we'll collapse this down so we can see the full preview. So now the HDRI image is providing the background uh, for the scene that we're looking at. And once again, this is uh, also fully immersive, a fully wraparound a background that we're seeing here. So as we navigate or spin around the project, you can see uh, what's going on in that background image, and as we let go of the resolve, you'll see uh, the effect of that environment. Um, now, one of the things with uh, the HDR, HDRI uh, backgrounds, one of the nice things is it can also contribute to the lighting of the scene. So 
we have control of, in this particular view that we're in, the HDRI uh, camera or perspective we have set up, we can control what uh, lighting, uh, natural or background lighting, environmental lighting is being used. So we have these different suns or heliodons that we've set up, day, shaders, god rays, relief. We could set up additional cameras for night settings or different times of the year. This is our day heliodon. Um, and uh, we can turn that off and just use the HDRI image as the light source. So now the uh, ambient lighting that we're seeing on this model is uh, actually being provided strictly by this HDRI background. Um, so, and you can see the effects of this. If we switch to a different HDRI background, uh, maybe something that's a little darker, um, then we should be able to see a noticeable difference in our view uh, of the project, or you know, for example, on the, on the white exterior walls of the building. Um, let me get this preview to show up. I'll just click on this one and see what happens here. Yeah, so this is a nice dark background. So we should see once that resolves, see how much darker the building is um, now that that's happened. So it's a very realistic way to get uh, accurate sort of uh, atmospheric lighting happening in your project. Now, uh, as I said, we can also combine uh, the backgrounds. So um, I'm going to switch back to this more daytime type HDRI. Click OK. And if we turn the sun back on, and go into our Heliodon settings, uh, we can, the one thing about the HDRI, using it as a light source is uh, it doesn't cast shadows. So if you want shadow casting, then you have to have both the sun and the HDRI background light source uh, set up. And uh, so we could, you know, navigate in, in the scene here and find where the sun is in the sky of the HDRI and then switch to the manual sun mode and actually physically drag the sun into position um, if we wanted to. Uh, let's see if I can do that. If I can find the sun quickly and easily. We're underneath the project. Let's get above it and find the sun if we can. It should be somewhere where all the bright parts of the cloud are. If we can't find it, that's all right. We'll just keep moving on. We've got a lot Chris. of stuff to talk about. Mm, okay, uh, so this sounds like I have some questions. So uh, this is the sun in the HDRI image. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so Aaron wants to know, um, are the shaders included with five or are they additional as previously? I, I think it might be related to the topic right now. Uh, as far as shaders go, uh, well, uh, HDRI backgrounds, I, I don't think there's any included, or if there are, there's maybe one or two, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. shaders, uh, there is a default shader and object library included with Artlantis, uh, something on the magnitude of maybe three or 400 items. Um, and yeah, that's a good question. I, I failed to mention in, the, uh, in talking about the shaders, the fact that um, with the shaders, uh, you have... Uh, access to the shader or the, uh, the Arcanist Media Store. So if we jump back in there real fast mm -hmm. uh, and pull up, there's two icons here. This one, this little grid, that's your, your media browser. That's what you have actively on your computer right now um, that you can access in Arcanist. And you have this little cart button, which is the Arcanist Media Store, the Advent Media Store. And that actually links uh, to the online Arcanist Media Store. and um, uh, funnily enough, I don't remember what my password is. I was uh, logged in before, and I don't. Uh, There's a lot of things to remember. Is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, suffice it to say, if you're logged in, you can navigate through the. Um, let's see. I don't think I'm going to be able to remember this. I'm not going to be able to pull up my password without everybody in the world seeing it. So <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> cool. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think I know what it is. That's all right. Well, it, that's something you can experiment with. Mm -hmm. Basically, you just you register, you click on the registration button, you create a, a username, your email address, and a password, and then you can navigate through the, um, through the uh, catalog. So what you see is very similar to what you see uh, when you're just navigating um, through, the, um, through your, your loaded library except there's a whole lot more content. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, I have gone through and, and loaded a lot of extra additional materials that you're not going to see in the standard installation of our Atlantis. Um, so there's a lot here that doesn't exist. Uh, so this is kind of what it's like to, to browse through the store because there's a lot of media. And you're going to see under each media item <coughs> the name. Uh, you're going to see uh, a number. There's going to be a little diamond logo, kind of like the Atlantis logo, and then a number. And that is, a, and actually, that's a credit value. And uh, the credits are one-to-one -one euros to credits. So one euro equals one credit. Uh, the Art Menace store is based in euros since uh, it's a, a European product. Um, so you can buy media vouchers uh, in different denominations, uh, starting at, I'd say, somewhere around $100, or give or take $20. I'm not sure exactly what the cost is. Uh, and going up to probably about $1,000 uh, or euros. And, uh, the more you spend, of course, on the voucher, the, uh, the better the cost per credit is. You get a, a bit of a discount on each credit. Um, but basically, the bottom line is you, you'll see a credit value under each item that you're browsing in the store. So that, that alerts you. And you'll also see when you're logged in the number of available credits right next to your login name. So when, if you're logged in, you'll see your login name and you'll see the number of credits you have currently available. Uh, so you can keep track of where you are with your spending habits, and mm -hmm. uh, and all you have to do is just click on the uh, there'll be a download button uh, beneath uh, the item. You click on that, and it will instantly install into your existing catalog. You don't have to Ooh. think about it; it just okay. goes straight in, and you can start using it right away. So it's very fast, very easy to use. And but I apologize that I'm not logged in to actually demonstrate this. One. <laughs> but Chris, I have a quick question. I mean, does it yeah. does that is that that's on your computer? That's not on the cloud, right? This, this, what, what we're seeing now is my catalog that's on my computer. Mm -hmm. The store is, uh, if you click on the cart and you're able to log in, the store is uh, an almost ident virtually identical interface. You're still browsing through a list. You can go through the different categories. So if you're in, for example, the materials, you've got these subcategories you can click on, basics, fabrics, glass, so on and so forth. So each major category has subcategories. Mm. Uh, that are directly analogous to what exists in the uh, media store. So it's very easy to find your way around, and when you, you know, when you found it in the store, it's going to end up there on your uh, hard drive automatically. So uh, they've also taken care of the organization of these items, which is, is uh, very nice. Uh, you don't have to think about that anymore. Um, and so you know, instantly you can uh, play with these uh, sizes, That's cool. these uh, previews. And so. HDR images are ac uh, are accessible through the catalog as well, huh? That's correct. Mm. If you have if you have some installed, mm. uh, and now might <clears throat> now might also be a good time to talk about this little um, item here. Uh, with Artlantis, uh, one of the items that it installs is uh, I'll just jump into the Artlantis folder real fast and show you what installs. Um, All right, so you've got Artlanta Studio, of course. You've got iVisit 3D Builder, which you'll use to um, convert your uh, panoramic and object VRs into iVisit-friendly files. You've got a couple of new items, one of them being the Artlanta Media Converter. I'm going to open that up. What this enables you to do now, in Artlanta 5, there's a new file format both for the projects and for the media. And basically, these operate as little containers, so they're going to store all the associated texture files that are used with, a, uh, let's say, for example, an object. And for the Artlanus projects, all the associated you know, files that uh, have to do with the project are bundled up into one file. So it's now very easy to move your files around, and you, you won't forget about where things are with the project. You won't have orphaned files. So that's a nice thing. Uh, but what this media converter um, application does is it takes it, it, uh, what we're seeing here in this middle panel right here, which is kind of one third of the way over from the left. This is a read of my hard drive and what existing Artlantis Media version four or older is on my hard drive right now. So I can navigate into, uh, for example, some of these third-party libraries I have and uh, pull up um, a catalog. And once I click on one of the items in this list view. Uh, it should generate a series of thumbnail images of the contents of that volume. Okay, so we see those pop up. 
And so this is now, this is what exists in my hard drive in a version 4 format. What, what's showing on the, left, or on the right side, uh, of the right half of the screen, is the version 5 catalog. Okay, and then the organization, all the different uh, major categories and subcategories. So what I need to do then, uh, for example, if I want to drag this bed over, I'll find the appropriate category, like uh, furniture, bedroom, and I'll select one or more items, and you know I can just hold the shift key down to select multiple items, or I can hold the command or control key down to uh, select items out of sequence. Um, but anyway, I'm going to take this item here and just drag and drop it from the left over into the right, and it's going to briefly tell you that it's importing the object. And if I scroll down, I should see, or there it is right there. So it's underlined in yellow when it's pending. That means it's waiting to be converted. And now this, but this convert button at the bottom will show up. Uh, so if you have any items pending, and I can go through multiple different um, volumes and, uh, and pull up multiple items. And you can see stuff that I've added already is going to, or converted already is going to show up as green. But let's, let's find an item like... Uh, uh, like this bathtub, and we'll go to, into a different category, and we'll add the bathtub. So now I've got two items queued up to import or to convert, and they're both highlighted in yellow. And you can see that the subcategories are highlighted, the major category and the subcategories are highlighted, indicating that there's pending stuff waiting to be converted. So I just click the <coughs> convert button, and in a second or two, if I hit it, uh, it'll convert those items and once the conversion is done the yellow bar will turn to green and it'll stay you know that that green underline will remain there and so that's how you can differentiate between what's included with Artlantis and what you brought in from previous projects so you can keep track of your existing you know if you have a lot of old content that you purchased you can keep track of what you've already converted or added to Artlantis 5 but you will want to do those conversions um, mm. for the sake of just stuffing consistency and having everything work properly. Okay. So that's uh, something to know about. So Chris, when you say old versions, I mean, how far back are we going? Like uh, somebody asked about 4.1, you know, will 5 import and sort your existing media libraries from 4.1? This is that, from you know, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm not exactly 100% sure how, how far back it goes. You might have to experiment with that. I haven't experimented with that yet, but I'm pretty sure it probably goes back to at least version 2, if not version 1. So, um, but it probably is not going to work with the old legacy Artlantis media. So we're talking about stuff that was available 10 years ago, Artlantis 4.5, before Artlantis was completely recoded and renumbered to be version 1. So we had Artlantis Render and Studio released in 2005. Before that, it was just called Artlantis, and it was version 4.5. That old media, I'm willing to bet, is not going to work with this media converter. But again, I haven't tried that either, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but definitely, it should work with the modern uh, uh, Artlantis media um, and bring it up to version 5 status. So you'll definitely want to take the time to do that when you have the free time to do it. You don't have to do it all at once. You've got an easy way to keep track of with that with that little underlining system, so you know, you'll, you'll know where you are. So you can really almost do it on an as-needed basis if you, if you really want to. Um, all right, let's get back to um, task here. I'm going to quickly run out of time if I don't uh, keep moving along here. So let's jump into one of the really cool new features of Artlantis. Uh, it's kind of a probably under the category of bells and whistles. Uh, that is the <coughs> uh, God's rays or um, sunbeam. So uh, we activate that by going into the sun setting and clicking on the sunbeam button. And this is a, in actual fact a post-process effect. So it is rendering this on the fly um, as a post-process post type of filter. Um, so it's very quick, it's very efficient. So you can see the, the effects of uh, that sun. So you know, if you've got the sun behind clouds or behind some kind of obstruction, like trees or, or telephone pole or hills or mountains, you're going to see these rays um, coming through. It'll even come through windows uh, and that sort of thing. So it's a really cool effect. Uh, volumetric lighting is, is uh, you know, what this is all about. Um, <clears throat> 
it will only work if the sun is placed kind of within the frame of, of view, so you, it needs to be kind of in front of the camera. If the sun's behind the camera, you're not going to see this effect happen. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the next item here, the uh, shader inspector. We did get a question earlier about uh, shaders in Atlantis. I'm going to um, jump back into my perspectives, and we're going to take this bed and click on it. And get rid of it so we can see the floor. And uh, so let's go into our shaders interface here and pull up our uh, shaders. Uh, we'll browse through some of the floor surfaces here. We've got carpets, and marble tiles, and all sorts of different things that are installed here. And I'm going to, maybe I'll navigate to um, some kind of parquet floor. I'll try this here. So as uh, before in Artlantis, uh, the drag and drop is the, the, the way things happen. Very fast and efficient, quick and easy way to get your media into the scene just by dragging from the menu uh, or the catalog and dropping directly where you want that item to be in the 3D preview window. Um, so we can see this uh, shader in here now. And uh, we can, you know, play with the scale up here and the parameters. So as I move this slider up, you'll see the effect of the parquet floor uh, enlarging. And we can, of course, um, play with the uh, orientation of the um, uh, uh, material. We can also click to add um, uh, or mix in a color. So if we want this to be maybe a little more of a kind of a cherry stained color, we might drop our slider up, uh, give it sort of a red hue, and give it a little bit of saturation, and maybe drop the brightness down a little bit to give it a little more richness. And so, um, of course, we can do that. That's nothing new. Um, but what is new with the shaders is uh, we have the ability to um, click and hold on the shader, assuming this works properly. We have the ability to uh, adjust the shader on the fly directly in the scene. So we can see this little yellow dot here. I don't know if you can see that or not on your screen. It's a little yellow dot that's close to the uh, center of this uh, tile, uh, this repeated, repeatable tile. Uh, that uh, functions as a rotation wheel. And so we can spin right directly in the scene uh, the uh, texture um, and we can hold the shift key down to lock and to preset uh, 15 degree increments if we want as we're rotating. So we just pick something we like there. Uh, we can also grab the corner and reposition the uh, texture however we want. I'm going to give this a 90 degree orientation. Of course, we can also enter numeric values in our orientation. Um, and so if we click on that again and hold, we have to hold down for a second. And we can also drag by the edge. And as we get close to a surface, if we hold the shift key down, you can see that it's locking onto the geometry in the scene. So that's pretty cool. We have the ability to orient these textures based on geometry, existing geometry in the scene. So that's, that's a real time saver if you're trying to um, do that sort of thing. Atlantis. So as we get close to the edge, we hold that shift key down and it locks in. So that's uh, definitely a very nice little feature that we've got in Atlantis. So um, let me keep moving along because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. And I'm fearful I'm going to run out of time if I don't keep moving. Um, now, if we go into the settings here, this button on the right, we can click. Uh, uh, a button that pulls up the parameters for this shader. And so we can go in and reconfigure uh, or add or take away uh, different, uh, um, let's say, maps uh, for the shader. So we could add, add, for example, a bump map, a normal map, an alpha channel uh, to achieve different effects with the shader. Um, and we can adjust the level of shininess, of reflection, uh, the perception of bump, uh, the 
normals. Normals are kind of bump on steroids, and they can do different things. Uh, there's also a new 3D effect uh, slider, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and we can save that shader now. Uh, we had gotten a question earlier about the preview. Where is that done? Well, this is it. You click on this box. You have to kind of pre-configure your view. As far as I know, that's still the case. You have to have some kind of image to use as a preview. If you don't, it'll base it off the diffuse map. So uh, that's, that's what you do there. And then if you're happy with it, you click Save As, and you can save a copy of the shader uh, as a new shader in your library. Uh, uh, and you can, you know, you can define the preset settings here for each item. Um, click cancel on that. Um, one of the, um, let's see, let me see this here. Let's move on to the next item here. I lost my place. Where am I? Okay, so we talked about um, how you can move the uh, shaders around and navigate those sorts of things on the fly. Now let's talk about the one of the new features. If you've been watching the preview videos on the artlantis5.com website, which was showing a series of uh, preview videos of the new features in Artlantis leading up to the release of uh, Artlantis 5 this week, uh, you probably caught this one. It's the relief uh, or depth uh, values to the, the shaders. So if we find um, an appropriate material, um, like, for example, this, and we'll drop it onto this wall surface here. This is a wall. Uh, what you'll see here is, uh, you know, a kind of a standard-looking brick wall. Uh, we can, as, as before in Artlantis, we can adjust the bump value to give a little extra punch or the appearance of a little extra depth to that surface. And the same thing also is true of the, the normal shader. You can see how the... Um, as we slide it down, uh, the shadows kind of uh, diminish, and as we slide it up, they uh, get exaggerated. Uh, they appear darker and fuller. And then as we add the 3D effect slider, you can see uh, a dramatic transformation in the apparent depth of the, uh, uh, the grout lines in the, in the brick wall. So um, this requires a separate kind of map, just like a bump map or a normal map, in order to work properly. Um, it's not, uh, you know, I've been asked this before, is this true volumetric 3D effects? And no, it's not actually. In other words, if you go to the edge of this wall, you wouldn't actually be able to read uh, depth in the grout. It's still going to be straight edge. Uh, so it's not true volumetric. But it is doing a lot to really enhance the appearance of depth in that wall um, to uh, uh, give it uh, you know, a little more character. Jump to my next page here and, and uh, move forward on to the next topic. Let's talk about uh, the natural shaders. We already talked about the store. I kind of jumped ahead to do that. So let's talk about natural shaders. Um, and go to this view, and we'll switch to our natural shader um, category. And um, I've got so many of these things now. So uh, I think, yeah, this is one of our natural shaders, lawn one, two, and three. Uh, so uh, this is a view of our project. Let me go back to uh, the regular sign here the regular time of day for this. So we've got these different shaders here. These are natural uh, shaders. And what that means is they're mixing uh, two or more different kinds of shaders together to eliminate the repetitive effects that you often see in a uh, uh, bitmap-based uh, shader. Uh, you know, how things tile, you start to see the repeats, and then you kind of very quickly lose the illusion of this being a grass surface because, well, you, know, you can see the repeats. So what this does, if we apply this uh, shader to the grass surface um, and go into our shaders, uh, shader settings, uh, we have a couple of sliders here added called thresholds. So we can adjust the level. I think it's actually probably easier to see this in one of the other shaders, so I'll switch to this one here. Uh, we can uh, adjust the threshold, and you'll see as we do that, I'll drop it way down, the one, the, let's say the greener uh, 
texture that is applied to this uh, takes, takes dominance. Uh, as we slide it up, then the more brownish uh, texture takes precedence and starts to override. And you can still see little patches of the green in here. So it's just a kind of an organic way to create a certain look for the ground, uh, more of a, a randomized look. And, and in fact, you can randomize the way that, the, just like the clouds, you can randomize um, the uh, seed value for these uh, natural shaders to get different um, configurations of grass. And the transition affects the overall sharpness or softness of the transition between the one color and the other color. Um, so we could get a really hard transition or we could soften it by bumping this up and making it a little more smooth. But, um, so we, we don't see really any repeats at all on this ground surface. So now it's starting to look uh, a little more like natural grass and not so much like a repetitive texture uh, for the ground surface. I'm going to jump into, um, should I do this or should I keep doing that? Let's see. Um, we're going to, I think we're going to skip ahead. We'll skip the gravity. That was a feature of version 4. Uh, we could talk about it if somebody wants me to show it, but I'm going to jump into a new thing in version 4. That being um, some more uh, 3D preview based controls for uh, for objects, uh, it doesn't affect just the shaders in our planets. We have the controls on the floor, you know, for the edge, the printer. We can adjust the size and the location and the angle. You can also do that for lights or 3D objects in our planets as well. This is all happening on the fly in the 3D preview window. So I have a series of three lights. You can see kind of the rough, faint effect of those lights on the ceiling right now. I'm going to select each of those lights. Uh, together collectively by holding the shift key down. Now all of those lights are selected. And you'll see uh, something new in our Atlantis. It's a, this blue vertical line representing where uh, the uh, light, uh, you know, a perpendicular running from the floor to the ceiling, essentially, uh, running through the light. So that gives us some, some feedback on, uh, some visual feedback on where this light lines up with things on the ceiling or on the floor. Very useful if you've got uh, you know uh, uh, an actual physical light object in your ceiling, so you can line it directly up with the light in that you know that you placed on the ceiling and, and put your light into position a lot more easily on the fly in 3D. Now we can grab this uh, and move it around, so it's actually getting moved around in the 3D uh, space. There, um, we can take the light cone. I'm sorry, the light angle, and uh, drop it down from 360, which is you know, basically a point light, and turn it into a cone light. So now it's got an angle of about 70 uh, degrees. And we can then grab the axis of the light. Whoops, I think I grabbed the wrong thing. Grab the end point of the light and aim it directly on the wall. So we've aimed it you know, at, at a spot on the wall now, and we can move these uh, lights back into kind of in the position where they were before. Uh, we can adjust the light cones. Um, I'm going to turn the power up a little bit so we can see these a little better. So you have uh, the, the option to control much, much better control of the lights in the 3D preview window now, thanks to these, uh, these, items, these new uh, preview-based control settings. And I can you know, grab an individual light and individually uh, tweak uh, some of the settings. Of course, I can go in and pull up the different lighting profiles uh, to give a different effect for the light on that surface if I want to. And uh, you know, bump up the power a little bit. Some of the, the profiles affect the lights differently. And one cool new feature uh, for the artificial lights in Artlantis, now we already showed the Heliodon, how you have the God's rays um, coming down and creating this uh, volumetric lighting effect. That also exists for the lights, uh, the artificial lights in Artlantis. So if we click and activate the light cone and dial up that setting, we'll actually see a, a visible physical effect of the light uh, rendered in the scene. 
um, uh, you know, aiming toward the, the surface that it's lighting. So I think a little bit goes a long way for this, but uh, it's, it's a nice, it's a useful feature uh, for the right, uh, right kind of rendering. <coughs> Um, all right, I, it's at 3 o'clock, so I'm going to skip ahead to, um, let's talk about um, uh, a few more things. We're going to steer this toward doing the VR type presentations. So I'm going to jump into uh, parallel view. Uh, with your VR movies in Artlantis, you kind of want to um, uh, first start with a floor plan of your building. Uh, because that's going to serve as a reference point in, definitely in your panoramic uh, VR presentations. So to do that, um, <clears throat> we set up a parallel view that's just accessible through uh, this pull down here. So we select parallel view and uh, we want to activate the clipping plane. If we turn the clipping plane off, then you're just going to see a top-down view of the entire project. If we activate the clipping plane, then we can, uh, through the use of the 2D window, which I click up here to get that uh, to show up, we can oops, activate a side view of the project and zoom in and <clears throat> tell it where this uh, cutting plane should hit the, uh, hit the building. So if we zoom in a little closer, we can see in this 3D preview window, we've got the cutting plane hitting right under the ceiling if we zoom in really close, you can see that a little more clearly. So this is our cutting plane just underneath of the ceiling plane in the project. So um, with that in place and activated in this setting here, we now have a, uh, a basically an orthogonal plan view of our building. We give this a name right here, so we can click on this and type something that's appropriate. In this case, first floor would be appropriate because that's what we're looking at. And uh, now that is saved. Now the, the cool thing about our Atlantis 5 is this, this feeds automatically into the panoramic views that you have in our Atlantis. So by switching to the panorama and adding a panorama into the project, we have one in here already, and I'll click on the plan view to kind of orient you as to where that is in this project. So let's zoom in here. And so we're in the <coughs> space uh, that is technically kind of the dining area, dining room right here, looking toward the kitchen. And so I'm going to size this uh, window down just a little bit. So we can um, designate here uh, uh, the plan view that we're going to use or the, um, uh, the parallel view that we set up which we gave it a name of first floor. So we activate that here. And so now automatically when this panorama renders in Artlantis, it's going to automatically use that first floor that we created a few minutes ago uh, as the floor plan for that view. So when you're orienting or you know, trying to orient yourself in the panoramic presentation, you're a, you know, a customer, for example, or a customer client uh, uh, viewing uh, the project, uh, you can very easily find where you are on the floor plan because that, is auto, that link is automatically created, as long as you select it, you have to remember to select it, of course. So as before in our Atlantis, uh, we, you know, if we have a, by default we're going to have one panorama view in there, uh, we can add additional nodes um, by clicking on this second button here, and it's going to place it right over top of the first one. And so, um, oh, whoops, I think I just created a second presentation. That's not what I wanted to do. Try that again. Okay, so now we have a new camera set up in here, and we'll drag this uh, into this kitchen area, and so we can, you know, as before, we can spin around and see uh, what the space looks like uh, in the preview window. But one of the cool things about our last five is you can actually use the preview window as a full-fledged navigational tool. This is just like you would see if you're viewing the panorama in the finished product. So the preview window is, in fact, functioning more like a, the real thing, the finished product, which is what Artlantis always aims at as the, you know, the most accurate representation possible in the preview window uh, for the uh, Artlantis end user. 
So that saves you time. You get a you know get a sense of where you are in this space as you're laying out the view, which is what you want. Um, now uh, the uh, different views can be linked up by dragging, clicking, and dragging inside one and dropping it into somewhere within the other one. So that establish, establishes a link between the two. So if we're in that view and we spin around, um, we should be able to navigate over to the second view. Uh, now, of course, in the, in the finished product, you will see the name of the camera showing up, and you're also uh, in the finished product going to see uh, the map uh, or the floor plan uh, to help point you as well, so you can navigate that way. Um, all right, let's go into uh, another type of VR uh, in Atlantis, which is the VR object movie. So a VR object movie is basically a, a view of the uh, object as if you're holding a model in your hands. So if we zoom in uh, to the floor plan here, or the uh, plan view, and uh, we can see there's basically a, a dome or a sphere placed around the project, and I can uh, click and drag on that to expand it out. So you can see as I make this circle bigger, it's zooming out in the preview. And as I shrink it down, it's zooming closer into the project. So ideally, you kind of want to center this on your point of interest, which is typically going to be your building. And then you can kind of test this out and spin around and see what it's going to be like to you know look at this from the point of view of the end user looking at this uh, uh, VR object movie or VR object presentation. They're not movies anymore. They're actual. Uh, one thing that's new with the VR objects presentations in Artlandis 5 is they are now also tied to the iVisit application, uh, which means when you render this out of Artlandis, it's going to render it as a, out as an HTML file. So anybody on a computer or a laptop or an Android device can open these presentations right in the web browser. And for folks on iOS, because this is a flash-based technology, uh, you, you're going to use the, um, the uh, iVisit 3D Builder. So once that uh, presentation renders out, you're going to drop it onto the iVisit 3D Builder, and that will convert it into an iOS-friendly uh, file that you can distribute to your friends on Apple portable devices. So again, the preview window does function like the finished uh, the real thing, so this will give you an idea of what the end user is going to see. Now, of course, uh, our you know, finished presentation will be pre, you know, pre-rendered, so it's going to be very smooth and clear and crisp. Uh, but you know, this is doing a lot of number crunching to, to get this kind of uh, real-time interactivity in Radiosity. So, um, you know, as before, you can adjust the number of nodes on the um, the dome so you can reduce it and it'll render fewer camera points. Basically each node is a camera point and if you look at the side it's also going up around the project so it's elevating and aiming down toward the center so it's generating you know kind of a web of camera points around the project and creating a unique uh, rendering, rendered scene at each camera position. Uh, and the finished result is uh, what appears to be uh, smooth presentation around your project. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to wrap things up by um, going into um, animation, and we'll quickly talk about that, and uh, just cover a, a couple of bases. Is there a question? Um, well, we, we do have a lot of questions. Um, let's see. <laughs> we have a lot of questions, so we got to save time um, to make sure that okay. we get, answer as many as we can. Um, let's see. Uh, I have one. I have one just in from um, Darren, and uh -huh. Darren wants to know, you know, how do I activate my free upgrade to version 5? Uh, when I purchased yeah. 4.1 uh, a month ago, I was told I could upgrade to 5 when it came yeah. out. I, I do well, that's an excellent that. question. That's probably one of the most important questions to address at this time. Um, and, and with the transi transition over to the Artlanta store, that's all basically new territory for all of us, including Advent. So there are... There's something, you know, things to work out there, kinks to work out with the store and stuff, and that's all happening right now. Um, as far as the free upgrades, um, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, I have already submitted the list of everybody's name who's, who qualifies. So anybody who made a purchase on or after July 1st in the U.S. or Canada, I've already submitted those names to Advent, and um, 
I, once the dust settles, you know, with all the new things that are happening in the transition, uh, they're going to get right on that and uh, uh, send out the serial number. So it might take a, a could take a couple of days. It could take a week. I'm not exactly sure how long it will take, but that's that's already in in process right now. We've we, you know since Objects in Line has all the, the list the entire list of names in the U.S. and Canada, we just decided to go ahead and run that through now. So just hang tight now. Listen, if you if you don't uh, see your serial number or hear from us about that, let's say within um, you know by the end of September, you might want to get a hold of your reseller you bought it from. Uh, or uh, objects online, you'll still be able to contact us through our email. That's not going away, even though the website will be down. Uh, and you can ask, hey, what's going on with my free upgrade? You know, it's been a month, and you know, I expected it by now. And we'll, and we'll respond. Uh, just you know, because in the unlikely event that you got missed somehow, it, it definitely make sure. Now, the free upgrade window runs through December 31st, so you have between now and December 31st to make your claim. Now, like I said, we're already, we already automatically put all these claims through, so that should already be happening and you should be receiving it. But in the event that you don't, you have until December 31st to say, hey guys, what happened to my you know, free upgrade uh, serial number? And we'll make good on that. If it's after December 31st, uh, then they won't honor that. But you know, we're taking a pro proactive approach to distributing these, so you shouldn't even have to worry about that. But just uh, be aware that if you haven't gotten it by the end of this month, you might want to contact uh, the, the person you bought this from and, and say, hey, what's up? All right, <clears throat> before we go into more questions, let's talk about animations real fast. We'll just kind of wrap this up with a real quick and dirty um, uh, overview of uh, some of the uh, animation features in Atlantis. Uh, to do that, I'm going to pull up the plan view. And uh, <clears throat> what we have right now is an animation camera set up in here. And uh, to make this an animation, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. Uh, we just need to uh, edit the path and drag an endpoint down. And so I'm just going to kind of eyeball this. And so that is now an endpoint. And if we click on the bottom here and move this up out of the way, you can see there is now a timeline down here uh, where we added uh, what amounts to right now a 10 second uh, sequence. Um, <clears throat> now, as before, um, you can pull on these handles here to um, shape the path um, to whatever you want. So these are little spline curve controls here. Um, so, and you can also uh, right click to add a control point. Uh, and now you have a new independent control point that can be added to the path. I'm going to undo that. Um, and then, uh, so that you know, that's pretty much it. All, all, all it takes to create a path. And once you have that, your timeline is going to have some you know, useful information. Now I'm going to drop this up here, and we're, our our red ball, which represents where the camera is uh, in the timeline, uh, is at 10 seconds. So we want to rewind back to the beginning uh, by clicking this button here, and it jumps back to zero. So we can preview this now probably want to drop my frames per second down a little bit because my computer <laughs> may not be able to handle this handle this too well. So um, this will give us a four frame per second preview of the animation. So it might be a little choppy. Um, uh, it's not too bad. It's a little blurry. Um, so that is showing uh, the smooth movement. You know, Artlanis interpolates the camera position between point A and point B. We can also turn on the OpenGL. If we're having you know, some difficulty with the redraw, we can click this button down here in the bottom right and switch to an OpenGL mode. And so we can run that animation preview again. Um, and I don't know that it'll necessarily be much uh, smoother than what we were seeing, but we'll run the animation. Actually, it seems to be less smooth. <laughs> it's a lot choppier. So, um, you know, I'll stick with the uh, regular radiosity preview, which actually seems to be a little better. Uh, let's do one more thing. I'm going to get you know, back to a point here with this camera and uh, redo that. Kind of shape this like this.
Okay, and we're going to turn the editing on the path off. And we're going to add a, <clears throat> an animated person into this scene. We'll click on this button down here to pull up the timeline, which should then enable me at the bottom to switch to um, the, um, the palette for the, uh, you know, the media in our Atlanta. So I'm going to switch to the people objects. And I'm going to find uh, an animated person uh, like this servant girl, uh, which must be what they call them in France. Uh, in the US, we call them a French maid. Uh, so we're going to put her in the scene here. And um, uh, she should show up in a second. And we can, of course, as with the objects, uh, as with we can do with the shaders, we can grab uh, at the base of the objects and slide um, the position of this object around. So if I can grab that edge, then I can drag her in that direction. So you can see that you've got some edge controls here that will slide the object in a specific vector perpendicular to this, basically to this uh, preview rectangle. And we can grab the corners and do sort of free roam here if we want. Um, and we can, as before, we can rotate using the yellow dots. So we'll kind of aim her to face this direction. So I'm going to make her walk around this corner. And um, so I'll just drag her back here a little bit. I get my red dot and drop it back to here. <clears throat> and uh, we don't really need to do this with this particular model, but the, the uh, pink uh, axes there enable you to scale that particular object up or down so she can become an Amazon woman or uh, just stay average size. Um, OK. So let's go ahead and so she exists now in our preview window. We can see her as that represented by that blue dot. And let's go now that she's selected, let's go ahead and edit the path for her. And so again, let's let's see where we are in our uh, timeline. Let's get that back in front of us. So we want to make sure we're at zero zero. Uh, we'll click the re uh, record button and edit the path. Oh, whoops, no, not quite. Edit the path, add a second control point, and kind of shape that path so she isn't bumping into any corners. She walks. And OK, so I think we're, we're satisfied with the path. And, uh, so let's see what we get here. Let's turn that off. So um, now that she has a path in this animation and she appears in the sequence, you can see that her um, behavior setting is automatically switched to walking. So um, one thing I'm going to do with her, let's see here, I'm going to right click and see if we can get um, apply gravity set up here so she's not sunken into the uh, ground surface there. Okay. So now um, let's go back to the beginning of the timeline and click the play button. And now there you go. You can see that both our camera is animating and our uh, woman is animating in the scene. So the more action you have going on in the preview, of course, the more number crunching Artlantis has to do. Uh, so a faster machine, of course, would be beneficial at this stage of the game. I'm on a three-year-old MacBook Pro, <laughs> so it's uh, not exactly the fastest computer in the world. 2.66 gigahertz Intel Core i7 uh, with 8 gigs of RAM. So that's kind of a, what I would consider to be a pretty modest uh, configuration for our Atlantis, but it still works. So, um, okay, so I think that's going to wrap up what, we're, what we have time to do today. So um, I thank you for your attention and. Um, what I'll do here, I'll, I'll um, show you a, a, an animation and some examples of some DRs just to give you some
some eye candy, uh, some parting eye candy. So let's, uh, I'll pull up those as I'm answering questions. So Kevin, if you want to fire the questions off to me, okay. I'll open these things up and play with them while okay. all the questions are being answered. Just in case, though, we might have to keep the program open because, uh, you know, there are some questions about, like, specific things. Yeah. Um, yeah so. I did look it up. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's see. Uh, I have a question from Charles. Um, hopefully we can answer like maybe 10 minutes and we'll see where we'll go from that. But I do want to let everybody know that if we don't answer them live on the air, uh, I'm going to try to format the questions to Chris and his team at Atlantis, and then we're going to share it as a blog post. So uh, links are going to be provided in the follow-up email. But yeah, let's start with Charles' question here. Um, how will the media store work for those with multiple licenses? Uh, for example, if I have one license at home and one at the office, will the media store uh, purchase sync up? Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Uh, well, insofar as uh, your media purchases on the Artlanta store are now basically tied to your account, so if you remember your password and you're able to log in, you'll be able to download, you'll be able to see what you've downloaded already as you're browsing, browsing the media browser in your other computer. And you can re-download those again. You can, so in other words, you can see what you purchased and re-download those items. Um, I've not, don't quote me on this, but I think with the new file format for Atlantis projects, since it kind of behaves like a, a container, it should basically bundle up all the objects you've dropped into your scene. Uh, so those should travel with the project. So if you move your project file to a different computer, you should see all that stuff in there. So I don't think that should be a problem. Uh, it all resides internal to the project file. And that's a little bit different. So you're not, uh, you know, really so much uh, organizing your media. Now, your media still is, in fact, saved uh, at a, in a physical location on your hard drive. So as you're downloading media, uh, that stuff goes into a place in your, uh, your system folder, uh, like a public folder in your system folder, at least on the Mac, that's where it goes. So you've got kind of the familiar structure that you're, seeing in Atlantis, seeing the breakdown of all those icons for materials, uh, shaders, wall shaders, floor shaders, exterior shaders, natural shaders, and even the objects, furniture, decoration, lamps, office, so on and so forth. All those objects reside in this uh, folder structure, but again, that's all happening automatically. So as you download those things, it's Atlantis is automatically putting them in this folder. So anyway, if you're in a different location, you, you can definitely re-download any content you've purchased already onto that other computer um, if you're logged in. Hope cool. I answered the question. Um, I think so. Uh, let's see. Angelos wants to know, uh, can I use the Arlantis 3 shaders that I have already purchased, I'm assuming, in Arlantis 5? Uh, so can they use yeah, Arlantis 3 in Arlantis 5? Yeah, yeah I, I pretty much addressed that already with mm -hmm. the uh, showing the demo of the media converter. So yes, that's, that's what cool. you do there. All right, uh, James wants to know if there's any recommendations for the community to access some HDR uh, images to test in Arlantis 5. Yeah, I know we talked a yeah. lot about shaders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, um, um, let me just uh, get out of this for a sec. I do have some things I can, uh, there's one, a site called, I think, HDRI Hub. Let me pull up my browser and see if I can find that real fast. They've got a few freebies in there. Uh, HDRI-Hub. That's one place to start. And it, frankly, I found this just by doing a Google search. It, it's so easy to find these things. Just uh, if you search HDRI, and if you want them free, <laughs> type in free. You're, you're bound to find plenty of uh, uh, decent um, HDRI backgrounds you can use. But anyway, these guys have uh, a number of free HDRI uh, backgrounds you can download and use in your project under their free samples section. It's a good website too, so check that out. Um, but there's plenty of others. As I said, Google is going to be your friend there uh, for a lot cool. of that stuff. All and right. HDR is pretty much a standard format, so you know uh, if it's an HDR file, it'll work in Arlantis. <coughs> All right. I have a question from Chad. Uh, Chad wants to know, has there been any major changes with the real-time preview window requirements for his personal computer PC. Uh, the window doesn't seem to update as smoothly as it used to in version 4.1. Yeah, and uh, you know it's doing a lot more than it was in version 4.1. Um, but you can, you know, like I said, you can adjust the frames per second in Atlantis uh, here. So. 
yeah, I mean, basically it's going to be, you know, you're going to see less frames per second, but that's how to get a, a clear looking preview if you're getting into things like previewing animations. That's going to really depend on um, what your configuration is. Now, system requirements, I think they're always available in the help menu of Art Manus. So if you're not, you know, if you haven't been in the help menu before, you should definitely go there. There's a lot of good information there. Um, but new features are in here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the system requirements are also in here somewhere, but I don't remember exactly where um, they are. You can search. You might find it that way. There you go. So those are the system requirements. Uh, you can also probably find these on the artlanus.com website. Uh, probably either under what's new or under features, they always show what the system requirements are. Uh, so, let's see, I'm going to scroll down here and see if I can find that. Might be under features. But uh, the website is a, is a great source of information, of course. Uh, there's the support area uh, where you can uh, interface with other users or the support team to get answers to questions. So I would definitely encourage you to join the forum, to participate in that. Uh, if you have a support issue that isn't being answered, either your local reseller can't answer it or the forum doesn't answer it, uh, check out the FAQs or the tutorials. If those don't provide answers, then go and, and create a support ticket. Uh, you'll need to register or create an account on, on artmenace.com in order to submit a ticket. Um, but that's the way to get support. Uh, there's a lot you know, more I could say about the Artlinus website, but um, I'll go back to your questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll be sure to make a plug for it too as well. Um, let's see, I have a, Carl, Carl wants to know the animation. Uh, is that in Arlantis Studio only or is it in Arlantis Render as well? Yeah, uh, Artlantis is basically configured into two different uh, product offerings, Artlantis Render and Studio. Studio costs about double what render costs. Render just does still images. Studio, uh, w which include not only uh, perspective views, but um, the parallel views. Uh, studio does everything, including perspectives and parallel views, and also panoramas, VR objects, and animations. So that's what Studio is giving you access to, these additional three items in the, in the uh, inspector here you know, for the different types of views. Um, the file formats are identical, so you can open an Artlantis render file in Artlantis Studio. You can open a studio file in Artlantis Render. Uh, so if you have an office set up with both flavors of Artlantis, there's no problem there in sharing your files back and forth in the two different configurations of Artlantis. Okay, um, that's... So this is the object VR movie, by the way, that I, we're looking Ooh. at here. This is the final rendered version of that object VR movie. And I, I'm at a kind of a small screen resolution, so I'm actually kind of off the, you know, it doesn't actually fit into the view. But anyway, uh, so it's just like picking up a model in your hands and, you know, being able to spin around and look at it. Um, and uh, for the last thing, um, I showed the uh, panoramic VR a, a second ago. We'll, we'll open up a movie um, and just have that play out to the end. Uh, there's a, this is a five minute long movie. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to play over the uh, mm -hmm. internet, whether it'll be choppy or not, but I'll play it and see. So as I'm talking, you can watch this movie. All right, so while this is playing, I that's funny because, um, you know, you just talked about the animation and the door. Uh, Jerry wants to know, um, can the object be animated to open the door? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, in Artlandish, you can um, detach geometry from your model that you import. So, for example, you could detach a door from the model that you've imported to either slide or swing open or raise if it's a garage door. So, yeah, those kinds of actions can be done by detaching the object. And I, uh, if we include that in the list, I'll provide a, a little more of an in-depth explanation uh, on how that's done.
Cool. All right. So uh, one last question. Let's see. Uh, are network licenses still available? And I do want to add in, um, aside from that, there's uh, some questions about export plugins for ArchiCAD and, ArchiCAD and also SketchUp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So are those available as well? Or when will they be available? Yeah. Under the download section of Atlantis.com, um, I'll pause this movie while we're on there. Um, you have, of course, the demo version. Uh, so we've got version 5, you can click and tab between 4.1, 3.0, going back to version 1.2. Uh, and by default it should pull up your operating, whatever operating system you're using, but you can also switch to the other one if you want. Um, updates are going to show up down here for the different versions of Artlantis. There aren't any updates for version 5 yet, which is why you don't see a version 5 tab there. Um, documentation. All that stuff is down here. There's even an HDRI sample, so you might want to hit the website to download that sample. Um, plugins are a little further down, so you've got your plugins for SketchUp Pro, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, on the site, they don't have a version 5 up yet for any of these products. However, I'm pretty sure, I think for ArchiCAD, the, the Artlantis 5 plugin ships with ARCHICAD 17. Um, and I'm not sure about it, ARCHICAD 16. It might also ship with that, but I know, I'm know i pretty sure that it, it ships with ARCHICAD 17. Uh, and, but you're going to see over the coming probably weeks, they're going to roll out the plugins for each of these software packages. Um, now, if there isn't a plugin for your version of Artlantis, let's say you own Artlantis uh, 5, and there isn't a plugin for the particular modeling software you use yet. Uh, one thing you can do if an earlier plugin does exist, like let's say Artlantis 4.1, so, and you've got ArchiCAD 16 or maybe even ArchiCAD 15, you can export the project as a, an Artlantis 4.1 project from ArchiCAD 15, just using ArchiCAD as an example. Uh, and uh, because the files are forward compatible in Artlantis, that means you can open up a, an Artlantis 4.1 project in Artlantis 5 and then start using it. So there, you know, that is kind of a workaround for uh, situations where an export plugin does not exist. Um, so that's uh, something to try out. Uh, you know. So I hope that answered yeah. your question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, do we answer the one about the network licenses? Are, I think network licenses are still available, right? They are, and in fact, there's some good news on the network license. Uh, previously, uh, with uh, the network licenses, they had to be on the same subnet on your, you know, in your network, your local area network. And they've been doing some testing to get around that limitation. I think that Atlantis 5 uh, should, uh, the network version should be, you know, uh, basically free of that subnet limitation now. If not, they're very close to making it happen. Uh, so um, that's something to, to look forward to in a larger office environment. Uh, you're not, you know, if you've got multiple floors in your building and each one's on a unique subnet, or if you're in a school, uh, sometimes that can be the case. So um, thankfully, they've been working on that and addressing that issue. Uh, did I answer the question, the specific question that the person had about networks? I don't remember what the question was. Oh, um, yeah, I think network licenses, uh, he just wanted to know, Jose wanted to know if network licenses were still available, and I think they are. Still available, yes, yes yeah. they are. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so with that said, uh, I think uh, we had a lot to cover today. Um, I'll switch back to me, and I'll make sure to let everybody know uh, where they can get the uh, questions afterwards. So, um, Chris, I'm going to take over the podium. <laughs> Alrighty. Cool. Uh, here we go. Here we go. So we're back to my screen. Uh, let me know if you can see this. I think you can. Yeah. Uh, good to go. But yeah, um, yeah. So today was this this presentation was jam packed, uh, full of information. There was a lot of questions. I wanted to let everybody know that you can find the answers. Give give us about a week, uh, where um, Chris, we're going to send them all to Chris, and then Chris is going to answer that, and we'll share it as a blog post at blog. .novich.com. There are links with the follow-up email, so um, it's going to make your life a little bit easier to get back to us. Uh, but yeah, thank you for attending. Um, I know it's been long, but uh, there was a lot of information, and this webinar is going to be available for reviewing. So if you guys want to check that out, do so. I encourage you guys to.
but yeah, I mean, the Novich webinar series is brought to you by Novich.com. You're one of the largest online design software stores. Uh, if you are looking to pick up a version of Atlantis Studio 5 for Windows, we have it as digital delivery available in the U.S. and in Canada uh, with zero sales tax. So if you guys are interested, please contact our sales specialist, Bob, there. Uh, you can reach him by his email address at bob at Novich.com. And yeah, so there is um, there is a lot of it's ongoing uh, developments that are coming out. Um, especially, you guys have like questions about exports uh, for ArchiCAD and the plugins as well. Um, Arlantis.com is Arlantis.com, uh, correct, uh, Chris? That is correct. Yes. So um, yeah, if you guys have need more information, I'm sure Chris is right there. Uh, if you need support information, you need to start a ticket. That's the perfect place to find all the details you'll need and just to see and learn more about Arlantis Five and what it can do. So I encourage you guys to check it out there. Uh, and because uh, Vectorworks users uh, are able to use Atlantis as well, um, I want to encourage you guys to check out Novich's own online community, VectorWorking.com. Uh, join us to discuss the latest buzz. And also, um, when you join, when you sign up, you get a newsletter um, that covers a lot of the, the weekly topics that uh, cater to architects, designers, and Vectorworks users. So uh, yeah, check it out. And like I said, blog.novich.com. Um, this besides uh, weekly releases about what's going on, um, promos as well, uh, and the questions. We talk to, uh, we have interviews with uh, designers and people who are just like doing crazy and innovative things in the world of design. So uh, please check it out. Uh, coming up next week, um, if you want to learn more about uh, the transition to BIM with AutoCAD Revit LT, we have Heidi Hewitt from Autodesk who's going to be joining us to talk more about it. Uh, so if you guys want to check it out, novich.com slash webinar slash 86. And if you guys have any questions, comments, feedback, uh, feel free to email me, uh, kevin at novich.com. We're always busy, but um, I, will, I promise to get back to you. Uh, so, yeah, let us know on how we can improve as well, okay? And our channels, um, demio.com slash novedge, youtube.com slash novedge. I will be sure to um, convert and embed the webinar video on our channels by the end of today. So uh, it's going to be on demio.com, first of all, because they're faster. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, if you guys want the latest news, if you want to catch up with us, um, please like us on Facebook. Please follow us on Twitter at noveg. Um, Chris, do you have any last words you want to say before we uh, sign off on this presentation today? Well, as always, Kevin, thank you for a job well done, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, help you guys out with these webinars and, yeah, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, address some questions and that sort of thing. It, it, by all means, uh, whatever questions you got, send them along, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, right. So, uh, oh, I do want to mention that you guys can contact Chris at uh, objectsonline.com, right? Or uh, yeah, info at objectsonline.com mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or email. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you gave your uh, uh, email address to Novich, but that you know mm -hmm. either way, uh, get, you can get your questions to me uh, yeah. either way, mm -hmm. and I'd be uh, I'll be happy to take each one and give it the uh, the attention it deserves and uh, hopefully answer your questions for you. Cool. Yeah. So if you have a question for me uh, or about Arlantis, um, I'll CC Chris as part of it too as well. So uh, yeah. Uh, Got to make that metaphorical bridge. But, yeah, with that said, um, thank you for joining us again. Um, you guys have a good one. Ciao. Thanks.